and thinking, okay, if she can do this stuff, I can do this stuff. I'm mm-hmm. just going to fake it until I make it. <laughs> And so I signed that lease and I just didn't know what was going to happen because I knew people knew me from friends, but I didn't know if complete strangers were willing to put their faith and their trust in me. Hello and welcome to another episode of How Do You Do That? In the next few episodes, I'll be bringing you inspiring stories from my hometown, Oklahoma City. Today, Tiffany will be sharing her unique journey from biotech to custom-made wedding dresses. She has always had a love for fashion and design, oftentimes making her own dresses for special occasions. After working in biotech and medical device sales, Tiffany decided to pursue her dream of becoming a custom wedding dress designer. In this episode, you'll hear Tiffany's transition from her corporate career to owning her own business, the challenges she's faced along the way, and the rewards of creating custom-made wedding dresses for her clients. Get ready to be inspired by Tiffany's journey and the beautiful dresses she creates. So without further ado, let's welcome Tiffany to the show. Hey, Tiffany. Hey. Uh, So fun to have you in Oklahoma City. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is my first podcast. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was so convenient because this is the first time that um, I've done an episode outside of my little office in Austin. But it was so nice that you and your family are just three minutes outside of our neighborhood. It was so... It's just, perfect. Just across the street. It's the most Oklahoma City thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because your sister's around my brother's age. They all hang out. And it seems like everyone just kind of knows everyone in Oklahoma. I know. It's kind of nice. Yeah. It is, <laughs> but it's also kind of nice to be away too. <laughs> yeah. I totally get that. Like Kelly and I always talk about how it's fun to visit because families here and it's kind of I don't know what your experience is like but being away from home makes you appreciate being closer to family and the friends here and community here 100 percent. but it's also nice to like get back away into Texas too well especially when you're newly married I think you get that yeah (laughs) and you kind of have your own space but then when you're ready to be back with family it's really nice to come back Mm -hmm. and you got married earlier this year right in April. Congratulations. Thank you. Did you do your honeymoon in Italy or was yes. that just a trip? Okay. Yes, we did our honeymoon in Italy. So it was Mitch's first time over there and my family, we love Italy. So we've been just so many times because the food is incredible and the people are so fun. But we did Florence and then we went to this tiny little town in Tuscany and then we went over to Milan and did a lot of shopping. That's fantastic. <laughs> I see on this table, I, even on your Instagram, we, you were on the cover of Brides of Oklahoma. What was that whole <laughs> experience like? Did they tell you ahead of time they were going to be there? Or walk us through that. No. So it was a total surprise for me. I've been a vendor with Brides of Oklahoma for, I don't know, it's been a couple years now. And when we had our wedding, I knew that they are, they were usually go to print around that time. And so I didn't think we were going to be on the cover. I didn't even know if we were going to be in the magazine so I was completely shocked when my photographer reached out to me like a couple of weeks after our wedding and she goes, hey, look at this email. You're going to be on the cover of Brides. And oh my gosh. It was, I remember just freaking out in the car. It was so exciting because I wasn't expecting it at all. That's amazing. So were they there just the whole time just taking photos? Of y'all, did they help with anything else? So they actually reached out to my photographer and asked for our full gallery And I had no idea that they did that. She like had texted me and she was like, I don't know why they keep asking for all of the photos and if they're ready yet. And then as soon as she found out that we were going to be on the cover of Bride, she's like, oh, okay, I get it now. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. So you said you had worked with them in the past, like you had been a vendor for them. What, What did you do for them? So when we're a vendor, all that means is we are part of this big network that they have of just different people in the wedding industry in Oklahoma. And they help us market and help us build our business. They have a really wide reach for all the brides in Oklahoma. And so it's just really working with them so that we can keep this wedding industry going here. That's phenomenal. So maybe before we jump into your new, or I guess you've been doing it for Avario Bridal, is that how you say it? Yes, that's I, it. <laughs> I know you've been doing it for a long time, but maybe before we jump into there, maybe we can go back in time a little bit and start in college. And what did you study? Like, what did you major in? So I actually majored in business. I did entrepreneurship and marketing. It kind of goes hand in hand with what I do now, but it had nothing to do with design at all. 
my parents actually were not crazy about the idea of me going to fashion school. And that's exactly what I wanted to do when I was out of high school. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, okay, no, you need to get a degree, (laughs) (laughs) which I think fashion's a degree, but they're like, maybe something that's a little safer, which Mm -hmm. it makes sense. You know, my parents are both immigrants, so they're more about safety and security. And I'm over here like, I want to be an artist. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's funny. Have you watched the um, the Shang Wang uh, Netflix? No. It's a stand-up comedy. He's he's hilarious. He's a lot more appropriate than like an Ali Wong, but Ali Wong introduces him on the show. Love her. She's so funny. Yeah. So if you like her, you should watch him. He's he's humorous, but he's um he's like a very clean joke teller. Okay, I gotta watch it. Yeah, he comes up and he's like just the the classic Asian. You know, parents want him to be a doctor, a lawyer, right? And he's like, <laughs> right. Mom, I got jokes, <laughs> and he's like, I'm a stand up comedian now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's great. So if you have the chance to you should check it out. But I totally understand the idea of parents wanting you to take the safe route. And I think for me, they wanted me to be a doctor. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I guess I could do that. I, I like helping people in healthcare. Right. Um, and they have a lot of my businesses. So business kind of felt very hit or miss. It can be risky at sometimes. Totally. Um, so yeah, I, I, I totally get the, the idea that parents want you to take the safe route. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it makes it makes complete sense when you look at their background and how hard it was for them when they came to America and not knowing the language, not knowing people, not having any kind of support. And so for them, it's like, let's get a job that we know we can pay the bills, we can feed our family. It makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you go to school for business. I assume your d- passion for fashion <laughs> <laughs> feels cheesy saying yeah. that <laughs> but i didn't plan that but i feel like that probably didn't fade away so how are you pursuing that while you were doing your business degree oh gosh i remember having date parties and being like okay i think i should make a dress mainly because i can't afford a really expensive gown for these date parties uh-huh. let's just make it myself <laughs> it's more fun for me anyways so i would make stuff for me And then I remember people were reaching out and they were like, hey, can you make me something too? And I was like, okay. (sighs) And so I started making things for other people. And then out of college, it was was just something I couldn't keep my mind off of. So I remember getting my first job in marketing for this biotech company in Norman. And I would sit there and do my work. But then I would also sit there and like make (laughs) <laughs> like a little brand guideline mm. for my company that I wanted to start one day. And I just remember I just couldn't keep my mind off of it. And so people started getting married and I they were asking me to make dresses for them. And I was like, yes, 100%. Absolutely. And that's kind of how I fell in love with the bridal industry. Oh, wow. So how do you how do you even begin to start learning how to make dresses? <laughs> Did you watch YouTube videos? Yes. A family that taught you or how that work? A lot of YouTube My mom cannot sew a straight line to save her life. (laughs) I remember just watching so many YouTube videos and trying to teach myself how to do it. I took my first sewing class actually with my mom as soon as I graduated college because I was like, okay, I'm serious about this. I really want to learn. And it was when I was going through this really bad breakup and my mom and I were, you know, she was just trying to make me feel better. And so we were just kind of bonding and we found this class to do together out of Votech school in Norman. And I just remember getting there and thinking, okay, this feels right. I'm mm-hmm. learning something that I really, really love. And we had a blast together. It was so much fun. That's awesome. So you take the sewing class. I think I saw on your Instagram, you'd shared, I think in September, you were taking the leap of faith and going full time yes. into Avari Bridal. In that post, you had shared that you were spending 40 to 60 hours a week at work. And then working nights and weekend on your passion project. Yes, that was a very difficult time in my life. I was working for a medical device company. And so I was supposed to be in the hospitals at all times. And it was even during COVID, which was super, super scary. You know, it was super uncertain and everyone was freaking out. I had just signed my very first lease for a studio space in Oklahoma City a month before they shut down the U.S. for COVID. And I remember thinking, this is insane. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I just got myself into some trouble. Mm -hmm. There's no way this is going to work. And so on top of working 40 to 60 hours at the hospital, it was just nights and weekends and just grinding, 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 trying to make it work with any 
little bit of time that I had, but it was kind of fun. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it really makes me appreciate where I am in life today, where I can just take the time to really think things through and figure out what I want. I like to take risks, but I still get very nervous about them. And so just taking out a couple years to build my business, even though I was killing myself trying to do it, it made me feel a lot better taking that leap of faith a couple months ago. Yeah, I think to some extent you want to be a bit risk adverse. Yes. So you make <laughs> business decisions that aren't too, that don't have like major downsides. So that's probably a good trait to have. Yes. But for those who don't know what medical devices is, could you share more about what did that look like? What did your day-to-day look like? Who might be a good fit for medical device work? Yeah, absolutely. So day-to-day, I specifically focused on cardiac devices. So I was selling pacemakers, defibrillators, loop recorders, anything that really had to do with the heart. And so that meant going into the hospital every single day, working closely with doctors, working closely with patients, and really understanding the product, understanding what it takes to insert one of these devices into a patient and just kind of guiding physicians through that. I would say it's very labor intensive, it's emotionally intensive, and it's very physically intensive. So it kind of takes it all out of you, but you also give back so much. So when you see these patients after you've done these procedures, it makes you feel very whole. It makes you feel very fulfilled. I think people that are willing to work hard, they're not afraid to shy away from hard work and hard conversations and being in very intense environments. They definitely thrive in something like that. I have to say I did love the job, but I just couldn't help think about my business that I was launching. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was every second of the day when I wasn't working there. If it was like I was going in between patients or in between hospitals, I'd be doing research or listening to podcasts about how to really make my business successful. (laughs) So I think that's when I was like, okay, I love this, but it might not be for me 100%. Mm -hmm. Aside from loving your passion project, what other factors did you consider before you sort of made the leap and said, I'm going to go into this full time now? We actually, we as in my husband and I, we actually moved down to Dallas a little over a year ago. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know what I've done. So now I'm working a full-time job. I have a business in another state. (laughs) (laughs) What am I going to do about Dallas? Because he's going to kill me if I turn our little town home into another studio. (laughs) (laughs) And so it was kind of during that time when I was like, all right, I have brides driving up from Dallas. I have brides flying in from other states. Maybe it's time to think about a studio in Dallas. And so I was looking around for studio spaces and I finally found one in Design District and I absolutely love it. So then it turned into not only do I have a a full-time job, now I have a studio in Oklahoma City and I have a studio in Dallas. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) And it was when I was spread so thin that I was just driving to Oklahoma City Friday after I'm done with work. So whether it was 4 p.m. or 7 or 8 p.m., it was like, okay, time to drive to Oklahoma City. I'd have things packed in my car, ready to go already, and I'd drive there. It's three hours there. I would go straight to, like, my parents' house, or I would go straight to the studio and just keep working some more. I would do all my appointments over the weekend, and then I would either drive back late Sunday night, or there were times where I would wake up on Monday morning at, like, 4 in the morning and start driving back down to Dallas again. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) For work at the (laughs) hospital. And it was when I knew I was like, okay, I am just so overwhelmed. I have to pick one or the other. I just can't balance both anymore. Yeah, you're really burning the candle at both ends. Oh my gosh, yes. I uh, don't know if you know anything about shingles, (laughs) (laughs) but normally people over 60 get shingles because their immune systems are so low. But Mm. um, here I am, 28 years old. I was so stressed out. I wasn't sleeping any. I was driving all the time. I was working all the time. And uh, yeah, I got shingles at 28 years old. No one's ever heard of that before. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) It's brutal. Yeah. And so I knew I had to pick one of the two. One of the two. So now you have a studio both in Dallas and in Oklahoma City. Do you still drive back and forth on a week-to-week basis? How do you spend your time now? I do about half and half every month. So I spend almost half the month in Oklahoma City and then I spend half the month in Dallas. And 
my sweet, sweet husband. I don't know if there's any other guy in the world that can be as supportive as he is because he doesn't <laughs> see me for half the month. <laughs> but it's a lot of driving back and forth, just trying to you know, get my schedule to where it's like, okay, I can get all my brides in that I'm working with at this week. And then the next week I get all my brides in Dallas here. And then it just kind of goes back and forth, back and forth again. Got it. So tell, tell us about Avari Bridal. How did you come up with that name? What does it mean? So <laughs> Avari is a French name that kind of means in between the heavens and earth. And I was like, oh, that kind of works. It's very whimsical. It makes sense. Um, funny thing is my company was, it started off as Tiffany Elizabeth original, which is my first name. And then my sister's first name. And that was just kind of a mouthful. And I was like, that, doesn't, that just doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't work the way it mm-hmm. should. And so when I came across the name of Ari, I was like, that is just perfect. I feel like it completely encompasses the brand, the style, the aesthetic, everything. I love that name. I think it sounds it sounds very nice and your website <laughs> it looks great too i'm like oh this like this has that vibe to it so i really like the name okay i appreciate that <laughs> because i'm poor right now and i have to build my own website and everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah with the tools now it's not as bad as it used to be yeah like a, dra- a drag and drop functions that make it a little bit easier to okay. do okay don't put it like that i felt like a genius when i built it <laughs> <laughs> well yeah there's definitely a learning curve did still but Oh, I'm kidding. It's, it is it is a lot easier than what it used to be. I remember trying to work WordPress when I was doing my marketing job in Norman, and I was so confused. And so all these other sites now, they make it so much easier. I just like to pretend I'm an IT person. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever clients and customers come work with you, what can they expect? Like what's the process of making a, a custom dress or gown? Yeah, so... It's very interactive in every stage, and that's what I absolutely love. So I have brides that come in. Usually they have inspiration to show me, like they have a Pinterest board or they have photos, and we just sit down and we have just a chat. It's really no pressure, very low-key, and that's exactly how I like it because a lot of times just the wedding planning process itself can be very, very stressful, and so – I take out the time to get to know my brides. We get to know their style. They tell me what they like, what they don't like. And after they leave, I send these brides two to three sketches of things we've talked about. And so it allows them to pick what designs they like or if they need to modify at that point, we can do that. After that, we go through and we pick out fabrics together. And then we actually make them a sample to try on once they decide on the fabric and the design that allows them to really see the shape of the dress and then we'll go in and remake that dress out of the fabrics that they've chosen so that they can see the full dress we fit it to their body and then we alter it and then we have them try it on again and if it's perfect take it then if not we do another set of alterations and then they get their dress and it fits them perfectly Wow. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into this. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It's not a quick process, but that's what makes it so fun is, you know, I get to work with these brides for such a long time. So I really get to know them. mm -hmm. I get, I'm so invested in them. And at that point it's like, we're friends at the end of it. So how long before a wedding should a bride or a couple come see you if they want to do something like this? (laughs) Um, you know, three months is absolute minimum, but we usually do the best if they come to us anywhere from six months to a year, especially since we're getting so busy now. Is it just you that's working on this or do you have a team? I think you said you had some people in your studio sewing and working there as well, right? Yes. So I have help now, thank God, because (laughs) I cannot do everything myself. That is definitely my downfall is I always think I can do things all on my own. Um, but I actually have a good small team of people that help me out now and it's amazing because that allows me to focus on the things I love which is the design the talking to the brides and trying to figure out what they like and picking out fabrics that's where I thrive now the sewing I can do I don't love but I have people that help me with that part of it which is really nice yeah that's awesome so what is it like working with brides day in and day out. I think I've heard stories of bridezillas. Do you run into that? Are custom gown brides just a different type of bride? I think you're right on that one. Usually custom gown brides are their own breed. And I love them because a lot of times they're a lot more 
relaxed and they're like, okay, like I didn't find anything I loved. And so I just want to make it really my own. And they're so, we're so interactive throughout the process, which makes it fun, you know? being in constant communication with these brides, they can reach me at any point. If they change their mind about something or they're like, oh, I want to add this to my dress or anything like that, that's something we can do. And so I think it it can be a lot less stressful for these brides because we can make all these changes and they can contact me at any point. And we're just sitting down chatting and trying to figure out what's best for them. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the brides that come to you, they're looking for your services and guidance. And so it's a different type of relationship than maybe somebody that, you know, who comes into your store and looks around and maybe they can't find what they look for. You're making something that specifically fits their needs and suits exactly what they're looking for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you get your fabrics from? Like, do you source all of them? Do you already have some in stock? What's that process like? A little bit of both. I do have our basics that are in stock or if I run into really pretty fabrics that I'm like oh my gosh I know a bride is going to die over this then I'll go ahead and buy it ahead of time most of the time I start sourcing fabrics after we have a design picked out and then I go through and I'm like okay these are all the fabrics that fit these parameters that we talked about do any of them speak to you and then we go through and we actually purchase the fabrics from there but I have suppliers from all over the world some here some in New York some in Europe, some in Asia, it's everywhere. Yeah. So whenever you're looking for different fabrics or different design ideas, how are you finding your inspiration? Or I guess it, it's got to be hard to like create a new dress each time around, right? Actually, I think that's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> I get bored very, very easily. I think my ADD makes me very um, excited to try out new designs. Mm -hmm. And so I I do have brides that come in. And I always say I have two different types of brides, one that come in with a design in mind and one that comes in with a fabric in mind. And so it's really trying to figure out what is their personal style. And that's where, you know, coming in, sitting down, having a glass of champagne with me, like we figure it out together. It's just a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't get to drink as much champagne as I used to because we have a lot more brides now. But uh, there was a point in my life a couple of years ago where we would just sit down for hours and just chat. <laughs> just chat. Oh, wow. So it sounds like things have gotten, I guess, a little more stable since COVID. I think you had shared that when you first opened it, you weren't quite sure if it was going to work out you had to sign this lease. What were some of the things that you had to do to get it to become more stable? What were some of the challenges that you initially had to face? Well, I think in the beginning when I signed that lease, it wasn't like I had had this massive plan as to where we were going or what was going to happen. Everything was so new because I was, I was jumping into it at that point. Before that, it was, you know, just friends that would come and ask me to make a dress for them. And then it was friends of friends and it wasn't something that I had put all my time and effort into, especially monetary. And so when I decided to get my studio, I remember telling my then, he was my boyfriend at that point, but I was telling him, I was like, look, this is something I've always wanted to do. I don't know if I should do it or not. I'm not going to tell my parents because they're going to try to <laughs> convince me not to do it. <laughs> but I think I'm going to sign this lease. And I went and I signed that lease all by myself, totally freaked out. I remember consulting one of my girlfriends that she's she's a boss, like she's a restaurateur, mm -hmm. and thinking, okay, if she can do this stuff, I can do this stuff. I'm mm -hmm. just going to fake it until I make it. <laughs> and so I signed that lease, and I just didn't know what was going to happen because I knew people knew me from friends, but I didn't know if complete strangers were willing to put their faith and their trust in me. You had a bunch of great relationships from OU. So you had this base of folks that knew you. You had helped design different dresses for, for date parties. You've done some wedding dresses. Is your book of business primarily referrals at this point, or do you have just complete strangers reaching out to you now? I would say most of them are referrals, but I'm starting to see a lot of random people in different states and different countries like reaching out to me. And I remember getting my first message from out of the country thinking, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the power of social media. Mm -hmm. I would say most of my brides find me from Instagram now, which is amazing because it just allows you to reach a whole group of people that years and years and years ago you were never able to reach. And 
I wouldn't say I'm the most um, social media savvy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I do realize how important it is. And my sister who is 23 years old is always like, no, you need to do this. Oh, you need to do this. And you need to remember to do this. And so she keeps me young. (laughs) Yeah, no, I totally get that. Helps me figure it out. They are so connected on the latest trends and what's in and what's out. I've never felt more out of touch without talking to my brother. I'm like, what are kids saying these days? Right. (laughs) (laughs) I know this morning I asked my brother who's I don't know. He's like 17. I was like, hey, Mark, what does it mean to be mid? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Wait, what does that mean? I actually don't know either. Uh, yeah, apparently it means to be very middle of the ground, almost even worse than like average. So oh. it's uh, not nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you said people are reaching out to you from out of the country. Yes. How do you, I know that you said some people will travel to Dallas or to Oklahoma City. How do you work with somebody that is on the other side of the globe. Oh, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. <laughs> <laughs> so for people that don't live here, we actually do a virtual consultation and I actually walk them through how to do measurements. Mm-hmm. And so we actually get their measurements and from there we make their sample for them. And then we actually ship it to them and so they can try it on and we have like a little kit where they can actually mark it up and we're oh, wow. on FaceTime while they do all of this. So we're walking them through it every step of the way. And then what we've had brides do is actually pick a day where they can come in and fly into the studio. So we usually ask them to stay two, three, four days, and we just work on their design and their design only so we can perfect it for them. And they just come in and do, you know, we fast track it. We just Mm -hmm. fit them, fit them, fit them. And then by the time they leave, they get to take their designs home with them. Oh, my gosh. How does it feel to have people in other countries wearing a dress that you handmade, handcrafted, and designed and brought to life. It's unbelievable. I never thought I would get there. It's, you know, when you dream about something for so long and then it just happens and you're just sitting there and you're just like, how did this happen? And you're trying to remember to be grateful and not think about the next thing because I think that's (laughs) one of my biggest downfalls is I forget to be in that moment and I forget, you know, years ago, months ago, whenever it is, days ago, I was dreaming about being in that place at that time. And I'm just prone to thinking about the next thing and not really soaking it all in. But when I sit back, sometimes I'm like, wow, I don't know how I got here, but I can't wait to see what's next. Yeah. Sometimes it just moves so quickly and it evolves so fast Yeah, that, you know, you really have to slow down just to take it in. And I know that you're ambitious and there's a lot more that you want to do and achieve, especially for you know folks who are ambitious. You're always looking at the next thing, but being able to pause and just look back and be grateful for, you know, where you're at now and all the hard work that you've put in, that's got to be just so encouraging. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And thank God my husband always slows me down and he's like, look at what you've done. This is amazing. My friends do the same thing. So I'm very thankful for the group of people that I have in my life right now. Yeah. So for those who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to build their own business, what are some things that you did that you felt were helpful in making that transition from full-time work to making your passion your full-time work? Yeah, I definitely think find something that you are incredibly, incredibly passionate about because it's something that you're going to have to think about day and night. And it's something that you're going to want to think about day and night. Otherwise, it's no fun anymore. Mm. Um, I definitely think that you just have to be thick-skinned You have to put yourself out there. And that's the scariest part about it all is you can tell people about it. You can tell your friends about your ideas. You can tell your families about your ideas. But it's really nerve wracking to tell strangers about your idea and see their reaction. So I think if you are just, you know, open to really putting yourself out there and you're willing to put all that time and effort into making something happen, it can work even if it takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I've read about entrepreneurs and people who work in their different businesses and industries. And they talk about if you don't see yourself working on it for 10 years, then I probably wouldn't go down that path because oftentimes it can take a really long time for your business or your work to really take flight and to kick off. I agree with that. I agree with it 100 (laughs) percent. So where where do you see Avari Brado going next? What are you guys working on? How do you all see yourself continuing to grow? 
So I feel like if you would have asked me this a year ago, two years ago, a few months ago, my answer would be different. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when I first started Avare, I was like, okay, we're doing customs only. This is all I want to do. This is how I see the company going. But what I've learned, and I think this is something else that entrepreneurs definitely have to be receptive to, is customer feedback. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always, always wondering what are my customers thinking? What do they want? And... I would say over the past year, I've had a lot of customers reach out and they want something that I've designed, but they want to be able to buy it off the rack too. And that's something that I think will help me scale in the future. And so that's what I'm working on because there's only one of me and there's only so many customs that I can do a year. (laughs) And so for my other brides that are looking for something that I've designed, but are not able to get a custom, I'm actually working on creating a line of dresses right now that people can just buy directly from me and we'll kind of see how that goes. We're working on the distribution process right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it's it's a lot of different things that I want to do. I've just totally fallen in love with the bridal industry in general. So I'm guessing everything I do, and I say this right now, but I'm guessing everything I do it will be bridal related. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I think to your point, right, there's going to be a market for folks who want something that you've already designed and it really resonates with them and maybe it's not fully custom but it's like semi customizable still to you know put a little spark or flare on something that I don't know you could put a different twist on yeah exactly exactly so we're playing around with all of these ideas right now and it's just trying to figure out how to make it work I almost feel like I'm going back to square one again when I first started my company Mm because this is completely different a completely different process than what I've done in the past, but it's really exciting. And my husband's like, can you please get one idea fleshed out (laughs) before we start 100 other ideas? And that's my problem is I'm such an idea person. And so I'm really working on getting this ready to wear line off the ground right now. Yeah. So I know you talked about like always wanting to go to fashion school. Is that something you'd ever revisit or how are you continuing to develop your skill sets and your knowledge? Is it still through YouTube or... (laughs) How are you? <laughs> I, I mean, I still love YouTube. Don't get me wrong. I still watch it all the time. And I'm like, hey, how do I do this? Or why mm. is this doing this? I would love to go to fashion school. But right now, I think the timing and just <laughs> the amount of time I have in my day is dwindling. And so I probably will not go. But if anyone knows how to sew, please teach me more. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I know that we're sort of coming up at the end of the year. And are you a goals person? Do you typically set goals? Is this something that you've used in the past to help guide your focus? So it's funny you ask that. I usually am very goal oriented. And I think this is one of the hardest things about being an entrepreneur is you don't have someone telling you what your goals are or what your next steps are to get to, you know, your next promotion or a raise or whatnot. It's now me setting my own goals, which I found very difficult to do. But I'm working on it. So, mm-hmm. yes, I like goals. I'm just working on learning how to set my own goals. <laughs> yeah, that's such an interesting point because I think for most of our education experience or careers, teachers or your bosses or your managers have always set, you know, here's the standard, here's where you should try to achieve. And you're sort of externally motivated, but it sounds like as an entrepreneur, you have to be your own driving factor. Like there's no other people that are going to yes. really push you. <laughs> Yes. And I think um, something else I've always struggled with, like since I started doing this full time is when do I stop? Mm -hmm. So when you're working a normal nine to five job, you know, you're there from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. When you are your own boss, you're sitting there. Some days you might be tired and you're like, I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. And there's other days where you're like, "Okay, I'm going to work all 20 hours that I'm awake today. (laughs) But just like learning how to relax and set those boundaries, that's something that I'm learning right now where I'm just trying to figure out, okay, what's what's a good time for me to really focus on this? And then when do I need to let go and enjoy my life and my husband and my dog and my family and my friends? And so it's just trying to find that balance right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's really no true start and finish to your work there. Right? You could always be imagining your next dress or imagining how you could evolve your business model your mind's probably constantly racing with ideas and things that you could be doing oh yeah especially at two in the morning oh yeah (laughs) I leave well I now have to leave a 
a little pad of paper and a pen by my bed so I can jot down ideas or quick sketches in the middle of the night. <laughs> quick sketches? You like wake up and actually like draw? Yeah, because oh, I can't wow. go back to sleep if I don't put it down. I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. So you talked about competing priorities between work and, and life. Where do you see yourself focusing on that? Are you going to start blocking off time or do you have an idea of how you're going to try to achieve that? <laughs> I think I think about it a lot, but I haven't quite figured out exactly how I'm going to do it. But maybe start with actually taking vacations and not feeling guilty about it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a great place to start. <laughs> yeah. Are there other things about entrepreneurship that like people maybe don't know about or that isn't as readily apparent as you think it would be? I think it's really just the fact that everything is so unknown. Mm -hmm. You jump in thinking, okay, I can do this. I need the time to do it. But then you also don't realize, okay, I'm forging my own path. There's no right. There's no wrong answer. There's just you trying to figure it out yourself. And you can take what other people have done and learn from it. But at the end of the day, it's you ultimately, ultimately making that decision yourself. And I think that's, that's a point of stress that I don't think I realized I would have. I kind of thought, oh, well, I'll just know what to do. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone like me, you're like, okay, but I want to make the right decision all the time. But you're not always going to make the right decision. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what I've learned as well. Folks that you watch and admire, oftentimes when you get to know them, you'll start to hear that, oh, I was just making it up along the way. Yeah. And you're like, wait, <laughs> what? Like, you had no idea what you were doing. I was talking to my coworker about this and- and we had talked about a manager that we both really respected and admired. And he was talking about imposter syndrome. And like, I'm in your role now at a different company. And I have all these like fears that I'm not going to do it right. You know, I'm trying to figure out the best way to move forward. And Alex was like, you don't think I had imposter syndrome when I was leading you all? Like I was just making it up along the way. And we both of our jaws just dropped because we were like, what? You were so good at it. What do you mean you're just making it up along the way? It felt like you knew what, exactly what you were doing. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so real. I remember my first bride that came into my studio, my very, very first studio. And she came in. I had zero dresses on my racks. <laughs> like, nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this girl came in and it was so bare in there. And I remember her asking, oh, have you made a lot of dresses? And I was like, Oh, yeah. Hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of dresses like, oh, I've definitely done this before. And she left and I was like, oh, my God, do you think she believed me? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't make this girl think that I've never done anything before. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like your confidence has grown over the years? Do you feel like that feeling of imposter syndrome goes away? I time? think it wears off a little bit, but I'm not sure if it'll ever go away 100% of the time. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for a lot of folks, it, it can be kind of hard to do this, fake it till you make it. What helped give you confidence to be able to talk to brides with confidence and be able to like guide them and build trust with them? Like, were there things that you did to do that? I mean, yes, fake it till you make it. You have to have confidence in yourself, but I think it's also you have to know when there are times where you have to be completely honest. And I think that's where my brides helped me too. So I was confident that I could make them something. I was confident that I could figure it out. But there are times where I was like, look, I've never done this before. You're the very first bride I've done this for. So we're going to figure this out and we're going to figure it out together. And I think just having the ability to also be honest at certain times, even when you're you're not 100% sure what you're doing, I think that helps build that relationship. And I also think it helps build confidence in your customers because they know that you are there for them. You're helping them out. You're going to make it work for them. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of a balance between the two. Yeah. So I worked with customers like the last year I was on the implementation team for our healthcare tech company. And I'd always try to you know, express to them, like, here's sort of the limitations of my knowledge and here's what the limitations of our product is. I think initially I would be nervous to share that with them because my fear was that they would lose trust in me. But it's so funny how when you're honest with them and you share with them the limitations that they end up trusting you more and they come to you for more advice. And when you do say that you can do something, they really take that to heart as well. Yes, I definitely agree with that. And I think that's something that is hard to figure out is that balance because a lot of times you go in and you're like, I have to know 100% or else they're going to think that I'm not a professional in this sense. But 
you know, just putting your pride aside sometimes can be really big and helping you build that trust with your customer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fun part about doing the customs is because I really do. Like there are times where I'm like, I have never made this before, but we are going to do it. (laughs) (laughs) I love that you're up for a good challenge. Now that you've worked in the wedding industry for how long, how many years has it been now? It's been a little over two years now. Okay. Over the last two years or so, and you saw some things during COVID as well. I guess for those who may be interested in working in the wedding industry, is there any advice that you'd give them? Or are there things that you didn't know before the last two years that is like more apparent to you now? Okay. I would say the wedding industry is very, very delicate. <laughs> okay. In what, in what way? Um, brides take their weddings extremely seriously and as they should it's it's supposed to be the happiest day of their life i mean that's what we're told since we are little babies and so it makes sense people want to make it exactly them they want it to be perfect they want to have something different it's you know it's what we dreamed of when we grew up i personally find it very very rewarding to help these girls have their dream dress and feel their best. I want them to feel confident when they leave with their designs and they want to put it on immediately and they don't want to take it off when they come in and try it on. That's what brings me joy. But it can be very stressful because these girls have dreamed about it for so long. So it brings out a lot of emotion, which I think if you are the type of person that can deal with emotion very well, then you will thrive in this industry. It's all about listening to your bride. It's almost like a therapy session when Uh they come in. (laughs) You won't believe the number of times brides have come in and they're like, I just need to relax for a second. Can (laughs) we just sit down and talk? I just need to figure this out. (laughs) Yeah, do you feel like you take on the emotions of the bride? Like, does that get carried home with you? I definitely think that I have, especially planning my wedding last year, I feel like I can connect with them on a different level now that I've been there. And so it's like, okay, I get where you're coming from. Everything's going to be okay. (laughs) It's a lot of talking down from the ledge. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, just having that experience and having done this for myself and for so many other brides, it, it helps them almost feel good and confident in me as just a human being that I I share those emotions. I've been there. I've done that. And that's what's so scary for all these brides is a lot of them haven't done it before. And so they're really looking to you to be the expert. And so anyone in the industry, all these brides are just looking up to you and they're wanting you to kind of help guide them through their day because they haven't done it. Yeah. And I think to your point, there are so many expectations, right? You plan for months, if not a full year in advance for this 24 hour, maybe full weekend. <laughs> not even 24 hours. Yeah, it might not be 24 hours. And the bar is so high for what you hope and expect the day to be. For those that are going through wedding planning right now, do you have three to five pieces of make sure you have this that you would say <laughs> that would be like really helpful? Yes. I think one thing we went into whenever we planned our wedding was to pick out the most important things to us. And I remember sitting down with our wedding planner and she was like, what are the non-negotiables? And I think figuring that out for us, it was definitely food, definitely alcohol, and definitely the band because we are all about food and a good time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I think picking out those exact things that are the most important to you, that'll help you shape your big day. The second piece of advice, which is the biggest thing, and I remind all my brides this, is you've planned this. No one else knows what you've planned. Mm -hmm. If things go wrong, which something will go wrong, don't freak out because no one will know that it's gone wrong. (laughs) Just you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I know that my wife and I, whenever we did it, initially we weren't even thinking about having a wedding planner or coordinator. We're like, we could probably do this ourselves. (laughs) And then we started going down the path and we're like, oh my God, there's too many things. There's way too many pieces. And so whenever people come to us, we always tell them like, First, you should have a wedding coordinator and planner. Like, don't take this on yourself. And we found it to be really helpful whenever day of, if there were issues and things like that, our wedding coordinator was awesome. And we would say, hey, like, or she she told us, if anyone needs anything, send them my way. You guys enjoy the day. That was so helpful because it let us really take in the day rather than fielding, you know, inevitably something's going to go wrong. And so feeling like you had to be the person that had to navigate that instead of having the wedding coordinator be there and say, hey, like, go ask 
Rebecca. She's going to take care of it all and she'll point you in the right direction so that you could just really experience and enjoy the day. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were a big advocate for let's hire everyone to do everything for us so our guests could have a good time. I mean, the number of people that are photographers in my family or like people that could help us decorate and all that stuff. I was like, please just enjoy the day. Mm -hmm. We got everyone to do it for us instead right. so you guys can enjoy it and we can enjoy it. But you had a wedding in Vietnam too, right? We did. The wedding in Vietnam is totally different though. So here, you know, you plan for six months probably at, at a minimum. I think people can maybe pull it off in three, but you got to be pretty good and you got to have some good help. In Vietnam, it's really different. So they have these like mass wedding venues. So imagine a mall or like a hotel, many, many different conference rooms. Yeah. And they have five to 10 weddings going at any different time. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. Wait, that's amazing. And so what you essentially do is you send out your invites two weeks before the wedding. Two and weeks. Two weeks. And because <laughs> the theory in Vietnam or the way the culture there is that if you send out a wedding invite any earlier, they'll throw your wedding invite away and they'll forget about it. <laughs> and so you send it two weeks before, you pay the payments. It's like a fifth of the cost. So we had... Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. In the US, we had 150 people. In Vietnam, we had 450 for the same price. What? Yeah. And it included dancers, confetti, like the whole shebang. And the dancers just go from like one wedding room to another and they just like do their thing. But you would never notice because these rooms are just, they're just massive. And so you you pay a fee and essentially that includes photographer, makeup, your wedding dress, the whole venue. It's mass produced. So it's exact opposite of what you're doing, which is like <laughs> custom made. It's all just mass production, which... But it's genius. Do we do that? No, we don't. Do we do, do, we do this in America though? <laughs> yeah, it's so different. But, you know, we really loved our wedding in the years because we had invested so much time in it. And it was like so special, so tailored to us. I think there it felt more like, oh, this is like a more more of a formality to some extent. Yeah. And so there's definitely, yeah, there's a ton of pros, right? It was effortless and smooth. But, you know, in the U.S., you pour your heart and you pour everything into it. And it's all your closest friends. And so, yeah, That's very, true. very, very different experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so cool though i didn't know that's how they did it yeah. over there do you think you would do one in vietnam or oh gosh no i will <laughs> never do another wedding <laughs> mark my words <laughs> this is me saying i will never have another wedding <laughs> Funny. it was too stressful the first time around <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you've shared like a ton of great advice already on entrepreneurship managing your time trying to find work-life balance for those who are in college or maybe have just graduated or maybe early on in their careers, what advice would you want to give them or what advice do you wish that you had whenever you were at that age? Honestly, everything you do, every job you have, every person you meet, it teaches you something. And I think that's what I look back and reflect on today is running my own company. I look back and I'm like, gosh, that guy that I used to work for, I really loved working for him and you sit back and you're like but why did I love that so then you take all those traits that you learned or you say okay this was such a smooth process how do I do the same thing and replicate it or this was not a good experience how do I learn from that and so I think you just take all these steps because I never thought I would go from doing marketing for a biotech company and then selling computers at Dell and then to working as a medical sales device rep and then now to running a wedding dress company. Uh -huh. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't ever in the same industry, but I look back and I look at all these things and all these people I've met and all these processes and it's taught me what to do, what not to do. And it's kind of helped shaped the way I run my company now. Yeah. There's just something that you can learn at at each corner. And I think the most important part of what you said is taking the time to reflect on that because it's not always that that apparent, like what those learnings are. But I think if you take the time to, to step back and try to connect the dots, like there are themes and patterns I'm sure that you've recognized that you're able to apply those lessons to your current work today as well. Yes. And I'm impatient. And <laughs> so in the moment, all I could think was, how do I get out of here? I just want to do what I want to do. But 
it really was just great getting to experience all these experiences. You're, you're still so early on. And you've done a lot of seeding and investing. And I'm excited to see the harvest and the things that you'll continue to, to do and the people that you continue to impact. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for making time while you're in Oklahoma City for the short amount of time that you're here to to share your story and just to share your learnings. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yep. I'm excited to share this episode soon with everyone and looking forward to just seeing more of your beautiful designs and gorgeous dresses. Thanks. All right. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. Bye. Wow. How awesome is that? I could really feel the passion that Tiffany has for her work for helping clients feel special on their wedding day. As we approach the new year, I hope you'll join me in taking Tiffany's parting words to heart and reflect on the things we've learned, the people who've helped us grow, and how we can use that knowledge to continue involving in the coming year. Thanks again for joining me on another episode of How Do You Do That? I hope you have a lovely Christmas with family and loved ones. See you next Wednesday.